Thank you. Um, it's a great honour to be here. It's really nice to be invited to do a keynote for Mexa on my last day of UK employment. So I'm slipping in at the last possible moment. So that's that. I called this Creativity and Agency, which is the title of the conference, a theme which Mexa, my idea of Mexa at least, which is maybe sort of 15 years old, I didn't really think that Mexa wanted to talk about creativity and agency. It's not normally a popular theme. Um, but You've got a whole conference about it, so obviously times have changed and you're all here, so that's really good. Also, thank you to all of you for being here now, because this is the last thing. You could have gone home, but you didn't. You came here, so that's really nice. I'm pleased to see you all here. Thank you. Um, and I thought it's kind of because I'm moving to Canada, it's a kind of time of reflection, so I'm kind of looking back a little bit on uh, my time in media studies and how it's changed a bit, though obviously extremely concisely, because we don't have that much time, and I know you've got buses, trains, and planes to catch. Um, that's a brief acknowledgement of some funders of work I've done recently. That's a way of creating the impression I have actually done some work for this talk, because otherwise you'll be thinking, this is a very broad series of impressions. It's also a chance to uh, plug that book, because my publisher's in the room, so I'm making it look like it's their fault that I'm doing this. Um, the second edition of Making is Connecting is out in April. Uh, that's my best book. That's a relative statement, so I can say that. Um, if you want any David Gauntlet, all the best bits are in there, basically. Um, and it was nice to do a second edition. It's got lots of new stuff in it. So, um, let's talk first of all about creativity and agency. Then I'll talk about media and communication studies. Then I'll do past, present, and future, as you saw. Uh, and, move, and arrive finally at three things at the end, in about half an hour from now. Okay, so about creativity and, age, creativity and agency, I saw that as the theme and I, I was very happy because it reminds me of the old sociological tension between structure and agency, which is always one of the most uh, wonderful bits of sociology. I'm a sociologist at heart, um, as written about rather beautifully by Anthony Giddens about 25 years ago now, that, or more than that even, perhaps. That tension between we live our lives within certain structures, but we bring to it our own agency and our own wish to do certain things, to be creative, to have our own ideas, and to do things a bit differently to the norms, but also we live within the norms. And the way in which you fit those things together is always really interesting. Of course, uh, that's just me misreading the title of what I'm meant to be doing, because it's actually creativity and agency, which aren't things in opposition or tension. Um, they're things which go more easily together. So then I think more of this, which is one of my favorite quotes, um, and it's about the opportunity for people to be creative and to get their stuff to other people with as few in-between steps as possible, to be able to connect and communicate directly, and that's why the internet has had a kind of transformational effect on the field of media and communication studies in the past 20, 25 years or so, as you know. Um, over here, media and communication studies, what is the purpose of media and communication studies? I guess we've all got different answers to that. Um, we probably all agree that it's something to do with thinking critically about the media and communications in the world in which we live. And also I think it's about making new forms of content and tools and ways of thinking about the world, making a difference in the world. Um, I think it needs to be importantly about that. So it's not just writing down some stuff that already exists in the world. It involves the making dimension where we're learning to make things in new ways, make things differently make things anew and to change the world, hopefully. Of course, also, um, we have students who typically think of themselves as creative actors themselves. They think of media studies as a creative topic. That's often why they want to do it. They want to come along and exercise their creativity. Um, that dimension of it isn't always reflected in the kinds of things that we talk about in conferences like this, though it is to a certain extent. Um, and we need to be aware, I suppose, of, of what they're wanting to bring to it and what they're trying to get out of media and communication studies. Things that I think media and communication studies obviously does well, on the one hand, you've got, like, I've got Nick Cauldry there to represent the more philosophical, social theory end of media and communications, which by someone like him is done really well, and I think there's a, there's a certain market for an amount of that, but um, it's hard to do that well. There's only a certain number of people who can do that, like him, um, and a few others. Uh, so the scope for some good stuff like that, helping us think with rich concepts about the meaning of media in the world. Um, then there's the role which medium communications plays, medium communication studies can play in thinking about diversity, overcoming sexism in society by giving people 
images, role models, representations, ideas of how we can be in society, all that kind of stuff. Though that does happen, for example, with Laura Bates's work with the Everyday Sexism website, etc. That just happens in anyway, she's not an academic, that's the kind of thing that also happens in the world apart from us. So we need to engage with that, I think it's really good if we're doing that stuff, but that's one of the things which sort of happens anyway. Um, and then one thing I encountered in Mexa this time, I don't know if she's in the room, but uh, Jessica Bain was talking at one of the uh, panels which were about everyday creativity. Um, I tended to go to the ones with creativity in the title, uh, which were attended by 98% women, I thought was an interesting thing. Um, Presumably the rest of you were at the more conventional Mexa-type panels doing Mexa-type things. Um, Jessica Bain had done a study about online spaces where women, or mostly women, were connecting around craft and making kind of activities. And she'd identified a number of spaces which she described as consciously cultivated kindness, or characterized by consciously cultivated kindness, where people are making a effort to be nice and supportive to each other, to not be shaming or abusive, as people often are online, of course, on the dark side of the whole internet world, but making an effort to be nice. And there's a lot of nice people in the world making an effort to be nice. It's easy to think about all of the other, but, um, but that exists too. And I think it's, it's important to be documenting that and to be thinking about what kind of platforms we can create which support people being respectful, kind and helpful to each other, which is a thing that lots of people do want to do with each other. So you're not going against the grain, but thinking about how we can support more of that online is obviously important for reasons which I'll be partly touching on quite soon. Um, I divided the next bit into past, present and future, and that's basically just in terms of me. So when I say past, I'm thinking about essentially the 1990s, which wasn't normally what people think of as that kind of past. Um, but when I started out in media and communication studies in the 90s, we were a lot, you know, we were thinking about the traditional media. The internet was starting to become noticed, but that only really happened in the sort of second part of the 1990s um, and used by ordinary people, also essentially from the sort of mid 90s onwards. Um, so we were essentially dealing with a system which I think of like this, and I think you don't all think of it like this. But in terms of the system which is producing the stuff, you've mostly got, as you know, a very small number of people producing the stuff which is attended to by a much bigger mass of people. Um, and so for that reason in itself, not really a system that I like, epitomized by telly, where you've got obviously a very tiny elite of people producing the stuff that is consumed by everybody else. Um, we sought to find some hope within this picture by looking at those kind of media which seem kind of transgressive and thinking about how people could adopt certain cultural symbols to do more interesting things in their lives or that might inspire them. So, you know, in the, in the 1980s, we were pleased by like Edge of Darkness, which seems clearly anti-Thatcher, anti-ecological degradation, or even something like Sesame Street, which seemed to have a celebration of diversity and inclusiveness, which wasn't necessarily in line with, you know, conservative politics. Or we uh, got excited about mainstream magazines, which seemed to offer slightly different kind of lifestyle choices or which were celebrating slightly different ways of doing things. At the heart of all of this, as you might remember, if you've got a long memory, was Madonna, basically, who uh, did all of those things and more. Um, it was a great kind of cultural icon to think about in terms of the queering of how we respond to media and being able to attach all kinds of different meanings to a cultural figure. Um, so that was all good then, but all of that was just part of that system. It was a, uh, a bunch of stuff made by a tiny elite of people for everybody else, which seems like a depressing system to me. Um, in the deeper past, of course, even before my day, um, you had uh, figures like William Morris and John Ruskin and Rosika Parker, who wasn't around then, but reflected on practices of those times where um, Clearly, people did create space to be creative and to create small communities of local people who are interested in the same kind of stuff. They did not have the affordances of the internet where you could find people fascinated by your own personal passion anywhere in the world. So that was different. But um, a more pure kind of approach to creativity and sharing and exchange can be found in those places. And I've found it useful to try to attach some of those ideas from 
you know, far away thinkers from like the Victorian era about the power of making, the spirit of a maker, somebody who makes something, you can see within the thing they've made, the personal passion of somebody that wanted to make that thing. And then you can carry that forward to YouTube where you've got a whole load of stuff which is not like conventional telly um, and not to be judged by those kind of standards, but what you can see is people who just want to communicate something to somebody else and they've got a song or a story or a comedic sketch or whatever that they want to share with somebody else and that's the reason why they're making it and that's what makes them happy when other people seem to like it. Um, that's a more straightforward kind of model of creativity. Between the past and the present, um, there was, unbeknown to us at the time, a beautiful heavenly midpoint, which you can probably say is somewhere from 1997 to the sort of mid-2000s, as Joni Mitchell probably said, I think, you never know what you've got till it's gone. Um, that time when the internet was kind of flourishing, people were just trying out all kinds of creative, weird things on the internet. We often made fun of them for making their strange cat-based websites, etc. but they were trying out in a messy kind of way, trying out all the different things you could possibly do. And I've got that kind of cut off around the mid-2000s in terms of heaven, because after that you start to get the massive platforms which are just doing the things that massive platforms do, which I'll say a little bit about in a moment. You know, you know this already. Um, so there's that kind of beautiful time of just flourishing creativity, not really constrained by too much, not exploited too much. People doing stuff just because it's what they wanted to do, which is the kind of thing that makes me most happy. And that's what I like about creativity and agency. Um, present, as you know, uh, we do still have that, that we do still have the online spaces, of course, more than ever, where people can create and connect and exchange and have conversations and be supportive of each other and organize to do things. They do all of that, and that should make us happy, but at the same time, we tend to also dwell on all the things that make us unhappy, where we've also got vast surveillance, vast monopolies. You've got uh, exploitation, you've got all the bullying and abuse that we're certainly more aware of now, and I think there's just more of it now that you get online, and you've got both of those things. And that makes it weird, because they're both true. We tend to take quite a bowl, uh, Bowler, I was about to say, polar binary opposite kind of approach to these things. So the people who want to argue about how wonderful it is end up arguing with the people who want to tell you how awful it is. And that's a silly argument to be having, I think, because it's just two things. You've got a pile of good things and you've got a pile of bad things. And both of the things are true. You know, it is true that there are these online spaces, people can create and exchange, have conversations, organize to do great things, blah, blah, blah. That's all. That is the case. At the same time, all of the negative things that I just listed, they are, are also the case and are bad. Um, so you have to work out what you do with these things. And um, the pile of good things does not remedy the pile of bad things. But at the same time, the pile of bad things doesn't kill off the pile of good things or make them unimportant. So difficultly for us, I think, as academics, we have to sort of hold these two things in balance and try to work out how we can conceptualize this and what we can do about it. Um, we'd like to have big fights and decide who's right and who's wrong, but that doesn't quite work out here for those reasons. Um, <coughs> if we think about the future, which of course it's impossible to do, and I'm not gonna give you any speculations about what the future is gonna look like, but there, there are different ways we can get out of this fix that we're in, with in particular the massive platforms uh, sucking all of the money out of that economy and doing such, and gathering so much data about it, etc. Um, but we have to get away from things like Facebook, obviously. Um, Facebook's weird, isn't it? Because I bet most of you are on it, partly because of obligation, partly because other people are on it, and it's just a useful way to connect with people. That's all true, isn't it? But, um, but you know, when we were Growing up, if you're kind of my kind of age, we had to look at these kind of books in school, which painted dystopian visions of the future. And no one ever imagined, they, they were, you know, at least the people in those books were miserable. The world, we're, the world we're in seems to broadly think that it's enjoying being on Facebook, but at the same time, it is literally, as you know, just a machine which purely exists to sell you to advertisers by having got as absolutely much data about you as possible in the world. Um, and especially, I think, like, I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not a vegan, because being vegan's really hard. Um, and in a similar way, I'm not on Facebook, now I'm on Twitter, and you can say, well, Twitter's broadly similar, isn't it? But I think Facebook is clearly worse. But through that, <laughs> through that confluence of what they can learn about you from WhatsApp, from Instagram, Facebook itself, um, they, you know, they just hoover up so much stuff, and that is the reason why they exist. Um, 
You've got Mark Zuckerberg there standing in front of a slide that says data surveillance. You might think it's not really interesting. He would pose before those words. Um, that's because he was actually at a conference announcing that Facebook was going to, because of its concern for your privacy, great, great concern for your privacy, um, it was going to make sure that third-party apps couldn't do too much surveillance on you because that's Facebook's job. So, so thanks, Mark. That <laughs> They are looking after you. That's their job. Um, now, th this kind of thing, this, this, the dark side of it all, isn't really my area of research, as you may know. Um, again, I suppose it's a bit like being a vegetarian. I don't spend any time watching documentaries about abattoirs. I don't need to. Um, in the same way, I know these things about Facebook are true. But I think it's important to think about how we can get past this and make use of the affordances of the technologies that we have to do something better. And I think media and communications people want to be thinking about that too, don't we? Um, you get things like, this is just a bit that I plucked off the internet, but it's, it just seems weird to me, things like the wonderful Women's March organized after the inauguration of Trump. That gets celebrated by Wired magazine as being the defining protest of the Facebook age. It's so weird that we have to use, essentially, the evil tools to do good things, because they are evil tools. <laughs> um, and, um, and we have to work out how to live as people and as academics and as scholars within this world. But at least we can start by not doing Facebook, I think. It's just, that you get, like universities now, certain university websites say, sign in with Facebook. I think, you can't be wanting me to sign in with Facebook. That's not what we're about. <sighs> you know. Um, but thankfully, I don't spend much of my academic life having to get cross about this. So that's nice, because that would just be boring. Um, to, to summarize the point of what that was, um, we did have, in the past, just the world where we could create and make and we're not being surveilled. We were probably being exploited in other ways, but there you go. Um, and then there was the kind of the 20th century industrial media age where we are having to consume stuff made by elites. Sometimes some people were lucky enough to become part of those elites and then you thought it was all brilliant because you could contribute to it. Uh, and some of you may have backgrounds in that too. And obviously it's good if you get the chance to create and share and have that seen by other people. And the tragedy is when that can't happen. So then we got that glimmer of possibility that the internet offered to us, which still exists, but then quite quickly gets subsumed under capitalism. And to be fair, the were the it's, you know, the, the miserable people in Mexico who were pointing out that this was going to happen and, and I thought it was a bit sad that we couldn't talk about more happy things and I was wrong because they were right about that, that did happen. <laughs> um, you saw that coming and I didn't. Uh, or at least, no, I, did, I, I knew that was kind of happening but I didn't want to dwell on it too much. And one thing is, we couldn't have stopped it. But yeah, uh, those who were warning about those things were of course right. But I like to be thinking about what we can do that's better and nicer and happier. So there is still scope. Let's get rid of whatever weird message that is. Um, <coughs> there is still scope for embracing the technologies that we have and, and doing better. Um, but that's hard, of course, because these things are owned by massive machines within the capitalist system. Um, but what I'm saying in this talk is, uh, you might be surprised to hear me saying perhaps that I think it's a part of the role that we need to embrace as academics in this field to be trying to work out how we can be doing this better. Um, one bit of example that I is part of what I was adding into Making is Connecting in the second edition of Making is Connecting is I talked to electronic artists such as that's Little Boots and Emika, who are people who not only make their own electronic music using their own equipment, but they, so they write that, they produce it, and so you can just make all that stuff within your own bedroom, essentially. Uh, but also they, they have their own labels, and they distribute, and they necessarily do their own marketing, and, and they do all parts of the making and distribution process themselves. And one thing is it enables you to evade the sexism of the music industry and just completely work around the industry and, and to work around all of the other aspects of the music industry, the way in which the music industry keeps most of the money and gives you a tiny bit and so on. Um, of course, at the same time, it's much harder work because you're having to do, lot, you're having to do all of the jobs that previously the record industry was doing for you. Um, and for some people who step outside the industry, of course, they end up going, oh, yeah, the, <laughs> that, those companies were actually doing something for me and I 
it's difficult to do it on your own. It is difficult to do it on your own. But um, in lots of the things that enthuse me most about the technologies that we have now is just that opportunity to entirely do it yourself, circumventing most of the systems. Um, in terms of uh, what I talked about with these women was also about the sexism of the industry and so on. And of course, you still have the opportunity to be abused online in the way that we all do, and which is horrible. Um, but in terms of being in control of your own craft and making and how you get it out there, at least there is that now, and there still is that now. And even though Facebook has got all of this surveillance and blah, 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 you, you know, Facebook is just one thing on the internet, obviously. And there are many more things we can be doing and different ways of connecting and making. Um, but it's strange, I suppose, that we have allowed certain platforms to just become so big and dominant. It's not something that just us in this room can change, but th there's so much possibility for doing so many other things. It's kind of weird that we would allow such massive monopolization to take place. Um, and we don't need to, and we can still get away from that. That is the positive side to this. I was romping along because I thought we didn't have that much time because you want to leave at four o'clock and that kind of thing, and I've gone faster than I thought I would. But there we go, I end up on my three things. Then we can talk about it a bit, and then you actually can go home. Um, my three things are, um, as already indicated, I think media studies needs to be finding the roots and helping to build the paths towards a creative future. It's, it's part of what we need to be doing, uh, not only cri critiquing the things that currently exist, which is important to do, of course, but then what are you left with? We need to be thinking about how we can do better, which of course I know many of you do, and it's what you want to do and what we should all want to do together. Um, but I think now more than ever, we are needed to do that, and we have the opportunities to do that. In the 80s and 90s, all you could do was kind of argue with this massive media system, and there wasn't that much apparently you could do in terms of intervening or making new things, or making new pathways to things. Um, I think now we can do that, and also, uh, we live in this system which on a couple of days ago was uh, probably rightly divided as the neoliberal ref kind of system. Um, but it does mean that, funnily enough, our universities are more than ever wanting us as academics to do things in the world. That's what they want us to do. If only because they know it's going to translate into some ref impact points. But, um, but I think it's not only for that reason. Universities are increasingly recognizing probably, the need to engage with local communities as well as national conversations. And the REF drives us in that way as well. For those of you who aren't in the UK, uh, but you probably know the REF is the thing that assesses UK academics' behavior, and there's a significant impact component now. And impact is making an impact, making a difference beyond the university world. And that's a good thing for us to be doing anyway. You know, it is what we should be doing anyway, so that's okay. And so then, if that means that we do need to engage more in trying to change the media systems in which we live and to come up with supportive platforms to be able to be creative and to connect and do all the wonderful things that we hope that they could do, then, you know, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and so maybe we should embrace that somewhat more. Thirdly, I say, don't give up on the internet as an open space. I originally, I changed this on the train this morning because it just said don't give up on the internet. And then I thought, oh, actually nobody wants to give up on the internet, do they? But, um, but I mean, don't give up on the internet as an open space of creativity, conversation, exchange, diversity, and magic, as I put it there. Um, we can use it better, clearly. Um, and in particular, I think, trying to work out ways in which we can create spaces that support people to make and share and create and have respectful environments. What we know from research like that done by Jessica Bain and Alison Main and other people who I've uh, heard speaking here is that those things happen where you have communities of like-minded people who are just passionate about doing a thing, if they're kind of sufficiently focused on just people who are passionate about doing a particular kind of thing, then that works. You don't get people slagging each other off or abusing each other for pointless reasons. You don't get that in those communities, in the communities like Ravelry, which is the online knitting community, or other ones for people being creative, whether they're boat builders or drone makers or whatever. Um, it's not just crafts. Um, if they're all passionate about doing a thing, they just get on with it, they're excited about each other, and you get an interesting kind of, uh, what's the word? Uh, scaffolding, scaffolding of creativity. Educationalists talk about scaffolding in terms of learning, where it's like you're able to learn a bit and then get a bit of support to learn a bit more and a bit more and so on, and it, you kind of build up within your mind. But I think you can use the idea of scaffolding in creative terms where 
some people have an idea or they put a thing out there and it's kind of exciting and interesting and somebody's inspired by that. They're not copying that thing, but they're inspired by the fact that these people did this thing and then they think, oh, well, I could do this thing. And then those people think, well, I could do this. And it builds up nicely. And if you've got communities of people who are just interested in doing that kind of thing, it works well and you don't get all of those downsides of abuse and bullying. And they also don't need to be in any way to do with the monopolistic or surveillance kind of culture. So there's, there's lots of hope and potential there. Hearing people's voices and creativity without gatekeepers and the power to connect and exchange is still the most amazing thing, I think. That is just a great thing about the internet, basically, uh, which hopefully they can't take away from us. Um, and we need to think about ways of using those technologies in better and more inspiring ways so that people can do good stuff and be nice to each other. There you go. Thank you. <laughs>